Okay. So, chapter 23, it's about when you have a mean instead of a, a proportion. Okay, now think back to other chapters. We started off this whole process by doing confidence intervals with one proportion, right? Then we had a hypothesis test for a one proportion. Those weren't as complicated as when you had two, right? So it shouldn't be as complicated today because we have just one mean. So, but there's some things that are different. We're going to start with confidence intervals today. That's what we start with. All right, we'll get to tests later. There's going to be some differences, and we'll get into that. But just in general, if we can think through all of this, okay, let's think through all of this. If you're doing a confidence interval, what are the steps to a confidence interval? Like, what should you do? What's the first thing you should do? Check your conditions, right? Now we're ha we have means now, so some of the conditions are different. We'll get there, all right? But you are still going to check your conditions first. After you check your conditions for anything, at this point, you should be writing a sentence explaining what you're doing, right? So we're going to be doing a confidence interval today. I'll show you the name of it in a second, but you're still going to write a sentence, okay? After the sentence, you do all the mechanics, you do all the math, right? What was the formula for a confidence interval for one proportion? P hat plus or minus margin of error, which was the critical value times the standard error, right? We're following the same general idea, all right? The concept is going to be the same. There's just a few differences, okay? And then after that, part of a confidence interval is writing a conclusion statement. So I am blank percent confident that, right? So this is a good thing about this chapter. The good thing is we know the general processes. The bad thing is that there's just enough difference for means that there's going to be a difference. And it's going to get more difficult as we start to review, because then you have to keep track of your proportions. We have this. And for means, we have this. And you got to make sure you do the right things in the right situation. But that's where it gets difficult. But right now, we're just focusing on one thing. It shouldn't be that bad, OK? So, back in chapter 18, way back, we talked about using normal models, right, for the sampling distribution, right, for proportions and for means. That's where we came up with the standard deviation formula for all the proportion stuff, right, the square root of PQ over N, right, and so we came up with the whole normal model idea. Well, if you think back, this is from chapter 18, this is not new information. Means. We had to have sigma over the square root of n. Now, here is one of the big problems that we're having, and it's I don't think that I think it's just like a mutual problem. So we got to I don't think I speak necessarily the right terminology all the time, which is part of the problem. The other part of the problem is you guys don't think there's a difference. Okay, so sigma is the standard deviation of a population, making it a parameter. There are also statistics. So quickly, before we get into this, kind of understand the difference. So far, these are some things we've done so far. In every chapter, we have statistics and we have parameters. They are not the same thing. Statistics are talking about your sample, while parameters are talking about your entire population. So if you're thinking about the percentage of M&Ms that are orange, Right? We had a p hat for your sample. You had 100 M&Ms in front of you, and you counted the number of orange. That was p hat. That's a statistic. But if you're trying to extend that information using a hypothesis test or whatever, then you're trying to extend it to the population, which is represented by p, the proportion of all orange M&Ms, of all the M&Ms. OK? Those are different. One's for a sample, one's for a purport, uh, population. For means, what's the statistic and what's the parameter? We're talking about a mean. Does anyone remember the t terminology or the symbols? Because that was kind of been a while ago. Mean is represented by what? The statistic is going to be x bar, right? With the bar, that's like way back. I haven't seen that in a while, right? 
that's our statistic. That's our average from whatever our sample data is. That's x bar. But then the population average is mu. Those things aren't the same. X bar is your sample of however many people, and mu is everybody. Well, the same thing goes for standard deviation. We talked about this like way like a long time ago, like for unit one. If we have a sample, we can find the standard deviation of the sample, and that's S. But if we know the standard deviation of the entire population, we have sigma. Okay? It's important to keep these things separate. Everyone, hmm? S is your standard deviation for your sample. So if you did, like, took a survey of 50 people and found the average height or something, then the standard deviation is for your sample. Yeah. Okay. So here's why this is important that we know the difference. In this formula up here that I highlighted, right? The standard deviation from chapter 18 was sigma over the square root of n. But think about what happens when you're doing confidence intervals. The data you generally get for proportions or means or whatever is a sample, right? Why on earth would I have a sample mean, right, because it's a sample, I would have a sample mean and then somehow know the population standard deviation? That doesn't make any sense. Right? If I took a sample, I'm going to have a sample mean and a sample standard deviation, S. But why would I know sigma? Generally, I don't, right? So if I don't, I'm going to have to replace sigma with S. Then I'm estimating. And when you're estimating, that means we can't use a normal model anymore. That's a problem, right? That's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to use S and not sigma. Does that make sense? But this formula was just so we could have a normal model. And now I don't have that formula. I'm estimating it, so I can't estimate and use a normal model. It doesn't work. Okay? So that's one of the biggest differences about means than proportions is we can't use the normal model. There's a new model we're going to talk about today. Here's the good thing. The new model generally works just like the normal model. Okay? It's a few different things. So like the big concepts are still the same. The ways you use your calculator are still the same. Just different models. Okay? Okay. I'm going to cover this up so you don't look at it for a second. So this is a true story in your book. And I would assign you to read it, but you don't read your book when I tell you to read your book. That's a good story. You guys will appreciate it. Okay? This is real life. I have a feeling Jacob's going to appreciate it the most. I don't know why. I feel like the rest of you guys will think it's lame. But Jacob's going to be, like, into it. I can just tell. Okay. So there's this guy named William Gossett. Okay? True, true guy. You can look him up. You can Wikipedia him. Gossett. Okay? William Gossett. It's, like, way back in the day. Okay? We're talking not modern times. Like, way back in the day. He, this is his job. He is the quality control engineer at Guinness Brewery in Dublin, Ireland. How awesome of a job is that? That's a great job, right? Okay, but he takes his job very seriously. I mean, you know, think back. When you think like back, you think of like everyone kind of being kind of like stuck up, thinking about their jobs, academics, right? I don't know. That's what I think of. I don't know why. I think we're all a little more laid back these days. Whatever. Okay, anyway. So his job was to sample beer from each batch to make sure it was good before they send it out. That's his job. Like, that's quality control engineer. That's his job, okay? So... He could not sample a hundred different, like, cups of beer. Like, that, he would not be able to do his job, and it would be a hot mess all the time, okay? So he samples three to four, like, cups of beer from each batch, okay? But he's all smart and things, and is trying to do a hypothesis test each time to see if it's a good batch or not, right? Is it a good batch, bad batch, right? Well, again, he's only sampling three or four. That's a really small sample, right? And we saw in the other chapters, if you have a small sample, you can't use a normal model anyway. Well, it's back in the day. They didn't know any better. So he's using this normal model. That's a thing already, okay? But he talks to the factory, and he thinks he's only sending about, back about 5% of batches that were actually good, so making type 1 errors. But the factory says, no, dude, you're sending us back like 15% of the good batches. Because going, it's going back to the factory, and they're like retesting it, and everything seems fine. So they're like, you are sending us back way too much. Like, you have issues. We need to figure this out. So, of course, 
academic, he has to think about it. So he takes time off from the brewery and gets a graduate degree in statistics. I'm telling a true story, I'm not making this stuff up, okay? Gets a graduate degree in statistics all based on these problems he was having as a quality control engineer at Guinness Brewery, okay? So he realizes that his samples were too small and you can't use a normal model, but he's like, there must be some other model. And he comes up with one, all right? And it's not just one model, it's a family of models. Like, they're all about the same, but depending on your sample size, they change a little bit, okay? And he's like, I discovered this thing. If you discover this thing, you think you're going to want to publish it, or like, someone tells me about it, right? But he still technically works at Guinness, and they have a contract with him, and they think he's going to publish, like, Guinness secrets or something. Like, they're, he's going to publish the secret recipe, and so it becomes this big ordeal. So, like, if I had done this or you had done this, you'd want to name it after yourself, right? Gossip's tea is up there on the board, okay? But he can't name it that because he works there, and they think he's going to, like, give away secrets or whatever. So he just renames it as the student tea distribution, okay? So he does all this work, discovers the thing, can't even name it after himself, all right? How much does that suck? I know. But because of him, Guinness Brewery Quality Control Engineer, we now have this new family of models that we can use for me. All right? Yeah, so he was still working. I just took time off and went back. So, yeah. So, he came up with this new distribution so he didn't have to test more. He could just test three or four and they would work. Yeah, so that's where we get here to, yes. The book put Gossip's Tea in there to tell the story, but if you ever look it up, it's not called that. It's called the Student's Tea Test, or Tea Interval, or whatever, Tea Distribution, because he couldn't technically name it after himself when he published it. You're just going to call it the Tea Distribution in, gener in general. So Jacob's going to call it the Beer Distribution. Excellent. Okay, so here's the only difference. It's like a normal model. But like I said, there is only one normal model. We know that. There is a bell-shaped curve, and it is the same every single time. With the T distribution, it's a similar shape. It's still unimodal and symmetric, but it changes based on the sample size. All right? So here's a picture. The blue one is supposed to be the standard um, normal curve. I know it looks kind of distorted. I took it from the Internet. Leave me alone. Okay? But then you see these two other curves. All right? So you can see a sample size that's close to 30, the T distribution. It, it has a unimodal and symmetric shape. It's just not quite as tall as a normal model would be, right? And then you have a sample size that's smaller than 30. And you can kind of see it's just like this, like it looks like this hump, right? I know, but it's like it's on the Internet. So we're just going to imagine that it does all look, I know the pink one does look like a perfect normal model, right? But in relation to what it really is supposed to be, okay? So some things to think about. It looks like as the sample size gets larger, our model gets closer to the normal model, right? So if we're using large samples, we're probably going to numbers close to what we would have gotten if we'd used the normal distribution, okay? But a lot of the time with means, you don't have large samples. You have surveyed like 15 people or 50 people. Like you, normally you don't go out and get average height or the height of a thousand different people, okay? So that's why we have this different distribution, okay? Now, every one of these is different. So you have to specify which, this, which model you're using, which T model are you using. And you do that by naming the degrees of freedom. There's a really fancy name for just saying which model am I using. And then today when we talk about it, the degrees of freedom is just the sample size minus one. But well, that indicates which model you are using. Because you can see they have different shapes, right? So depending on the sample size, it's going to depend on the degree of difference. So that's like the biggest difference that we have today is we're going to use T instead of Z. Okay? Um, there, these are not just the only, there's not just two. Like there's like incremental ones in between. So yeah, you're going to use, if it is smaller than 30, it's going to be closer to what that looks like. Okay, but again, general idea and things to do in the calculator are going to be the same. But we're using a T instead of a Z. Okay, are we good with that? All right. And we said this earlier. The first thing you need to do for a confidence interval is check the conditions. 
Well, all of the conditions for independence are the same. Right, we have, do we have independent samples? Is it random? Is it less than 10%? Again, for whatever reason, generally with means, you have smaller sample sizes anyway. So they, you don't, people don't always check the 10% condition because you're using these really small samples. With proportions, there were questions like, okay, we sent out a survey to 200,000 people. Right, that's the large, you gotta make sure that it's not less than 10%. But most of these are gonna be like, we surveyed 60 people. 115 people, all right? So it's not gonna be these large things. For sample size though, we don't have success failure anymore. That's not the thing, because we don't have T or Q. All right, so here's the other difference besides T. For your sample size, you have to assume that the data come from a distribution that's unimodal and symmetric. We're using a T distribution, it's unimodal and symmetric. So we got to make sure our data is unimodal and symmetric. So here's what's going to happen. They're going to give you a picture of the data. They're going to give you the list of data, and you have to put it in your calculator and make a histogram in your calculator or something. You want to do whatever you can to make sure that it's unimodal and symmetric. Now, the book will say that if you have a sample of size 50, 40 to 50, you're generally okay anyway. Sample is large enough, okay? But make sure you're checking the picture if you can. We're not going to do that today because I'm going to give you ones that have pictures already. But tomorrow we'll go back in and check the pictures on our calculator. Okay? Are we okay with the conditions? Yeah? They're all the same except we have nearly normal instead of success failure. Any questions about that? Okay. Think for a second. All right. We're going to do a confidence interval with means. And it's called a one sample T interval. That's the name. One sample T interval. One sample T interval. That's it. Now, you have to be careful. After you check the conditions, you generally write that sentence, right? Because the conditions are met, that sentence. When you're talking about means, though, you can't say because the conditions are met, we're going to use a normal model because you're not using a normal model. So we will say a T model. And you'll specify the degrees of freedom. T model with blank degrees of freedom. And we can do a one sample T interval. Okay? Now, this should look familiar. It should look like the proportion when it says it's means, right? So I have a sample mean instead of a sample proportion. Okay? Plus or minus. Now, we used to have Z, but now we have T. I'll show you if I'll find that in a second. Times the standard error, and the standard error is S over the square root of M. Remember, it says this in words on your formula sheet. S is the standard deviation of your sample. Okay, taking back to chapter 18. You're, stand, you're trying to use a sampling distribution model. So that's a model of all the different samples, that, like all different means that could occur in samples of size, let's say 15. All right? So that's the standard error. This is a standard deviation of your sample, but you're just trying to extend this out to like all samples of that size. Yes, Jacob. So. On the yellow sheet. It says confidence interval, and it tells you in words. I said this before. Statistic. Well, in this case, our statistic is y bar. Plus or minus the critical value. We're using means, so we're using t star times the standard deviation of the statistic. Right there. It tells you in words. You're supposed to be able to fill in those words. We're going to do that right now. So in this case, we're using degrees of freedom n minus 1. So whatever your sample size is, minus 1. That'll change when you do 2. But 
at a one sample t interval, because we're doing intervals today. We'll do test tomorrow. We'll get the two sample means too. See how this goes? It's like all the same. We are. We're going to do chi squared. Okay. So the only thing we really don't know how to find is T star, right? So that's what we're going to do right now. You got to get your calculator. I got a problem even. I'll come back to the screen in a second, okay? I've got a problem so that we can do this. I will go back to that screen in a second. No, what? What do you have so far? Can effect. A T one sample T interval. We're gonna use a T model and a one sample T interval. We're not using a normal model anymore. One sample T interval. You need to def define the degrees of freedom with your T model too. That's what Hannah read to you. Because the conditions are met, we use a T model with blank degrees of freedom and construct a one sample T interval. Okay, on this one up here, all we're doing is finding critical values, which is that T star, because I've got to teach you how to find that, right? How did we find Z star? Like, how did I know that a 95% confidence interval was 1.96? Inverse norm, right? Well, we found, like, the middle, we found it was left over, and we put it in your calculator. Okay, perfect. So to find T, we do inverse T. Ta-da! All right, so go to... Second bars, the distribution menu. It's number four, Hunter, yours is in a program. It should say program inverse T. Then hit enter and it should say area left. It's going to prompt you. Okay. So this one says a 90% confidence interval with degrees of freedom equal to 17. That means our sample size is 18 because our degrees of freedom is n minus 1. Okay. So if we're doing a 90% confidence interval, What's left over on both sides if you're doing the middle 90%? 5. So in your calculator, for it says area type 0.05. No. Uh, that will work too, but not in 100. 0.05, and then the degrees of freedom is 17. And hit enter. You should hit enter, and it should say degrees of freedom. See, I programmed that for you. Isn't that nice? Okay, so you should get 1.74 or something. It'll be negative because it's that side, or the other side would be positive, right? 1.74, yes. So it's the exact same thing as finding inverse norm. It's just inverse T. Because that critical value is T star. Yes. So if I was going to write the answer for this, and I was going to say that the critical value, you should always, it does in the question, but in your responses, you should always do the degrees of freedom, and you write them as a subscript. Now, if your sample size changes, that means your degrees of freedom changes. So a 90% confidence interval for a T distribution is not always 1.74. Okay, with Z stuff, it was always 1.96 for 95%. And all that was 1.64 for 90%, but not for T. When the sample size changes, your degrees of freedom change, and it changes which model you're using. Okay, that's why that's important. Okay, everyone comfortable with finding this? Critical value. Yes? How do you do what, Super? This one is just asking you of a critical value. Okay. Now, there's this one box right here. See this box? I'm going to say this because it will come up on an AP exam, but then I'm going to not talk about it anymore. If for some reason, I, mean, I don't really know the scenario where this would happen. But if for some reason, in the question, they tell you the standard deviation of the population is. Right? Standard deviation of the population is sigma. Right? If you know sigma, then you can use sigma, and you can use z instead of t. That's okay. That's rare. That's hardly ever going to happen. You could do it. Now, I say this because... On the AP exam, this is what's going to happen. You're going to get a multiple choice question. And it's going to ask you about means. And it's probably going to be the stuff we've done with T, okay? 
But the choices are going to be as follows. They're going to ask me what kind of confidence interval do you use? And it's going to say one proportion Z interval, two proportion Z interval, one proportion T interval, or sorry, one sample T interval, two sample T interval, and then it'll say one sample Z interval. That is a thing that exists, so you shouldn't automatically discount it because you think it's not a thing. It's a thing. Just go back to your problem. Do you have one sample or two? That should eliminate some choices. If you're talking about means, does it tell you the standard deviation of the population or just the standard deviation of your sample? If you know the population standard deviation, you know sigma, you can use Z. If you don't, you have to use T. Okay? That's the only time that generally it comes up. They don't try to trick you that much from the AP exam. But it could happen. Okay? I'm not talking about that anymore right now. Okay? But does that make sense? If you have that one thing. All right. All right. I've got some more questions to ask you about T models just to make you think, okay? We'll go over them and then we'll do a confidence interval in a second. Describe how the shape, center, and spread of T models change as the number of degrees of freedom increases. Now, right now, all you know is that the degrees of freedom equals n minus 1, right? So if the degrees of freedom increases, that means technically your sample size is increasing. So that's really all it's asking. It's asking, as the sample size increases, what happens? So I'm going to go back to this picture. As the sample size increases, what's happening to the center? The, what's happening to the center? The center. The center stays the same. Like the mean, like the center stays the same. Okay. What happens to the shape? It gets tall. Yeah, it gets, as the sample size increases, so as the degrees of freedom increase, it gets more normal looking. Right? Okay. What happens to the spread as sample size increases? Yeah, the spread kind of gets narrower, which means the standard deviation is decreasing, right? Generally, as the sample size increases, the degrees of freedom increase, you're getting more normal. Okay? That's a good thing. Okay. We'll go with that question. Okay, one more of that kind of thing. Describe how the critical value of T for a 95% confidence interval changes as the number of degrees of freedom increases. So, this is what I want you to do. I want you to play in your calculator real fast. All right? For 95% confidence, what are you going to type in for your area? 0.025, and I want you to start with the degrees of freedom that's small, and then do it again for one that's like way larger, and then again for something way larger, so you can see how it changes, and we'll discuss it. Yeah, type in that for your area in inverse T, and then change the degrees of freedom, make it increase. Keep doing it a few times. So what's happening to that critical value? Well, okay, if you're looking at the negative, it's getting larger, right? Okay. So that should make sense. Go back to this picture. If we start out here with a sample size that's smaller than 30, that means the degrees of freedom is small, right? Then let's say this is 95% right here, right? Um, you have, or sorry, it extends out here. So like 95% starts out here, but then you increase the degrees of freedom, it's actually like right here, right? If you look at the numbers, you get closer and closer to two, sort of, right? And we said as the sample size increases, degrees of freedom increase, we get closer to a normal model. What's the Z critical value for 95%? 1.96. So it's getting closer to 1.96. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Then let's do some problems. We've got three questions to do. I'm going to get them done. All right? They're all related. They're all about the same thing. A medical researcher measured the pulse rates and beats per minute of a sample of randomly selected adults and found the following student's T-based confidence interval. And it gives you a printout right here. Explain carefully what that software output means. 
That's just asking you to interpret the interval, which we haven't done today. All right, so I want to make sure we know how to interpret the interval. So here we go. How do you think I'm going to start it? I am 95% confident. We're just interpreting, the, the interval's already done for us. We're just interpreting it. So I'm 95% confident that. Now, we're not talking about proportion. That's the true, we're talking about means, right? You can say the true mean pulse rate or the true average pulse rate, whatever you want to say. Is between 70.88 and 74.497 feet per minute. It is very important that you put units on these. The proportions, you have percentages, right? Okay. But now you have to state, so you're not, if not, you have these numbers. If I say the true average pulse rate is between 70.88 and 74.497, what? What they measure it in, All right? So make sure you have units, okay? Yeah, beats per minute. Is everyone okay with writing that sentence? We've seen that sentence a lot. Just make sure you remember using averages. On B, what's the margin of error for this interval? Well, if I need to know the margin of error, I need to know the center. I need to know what the mean is. So how would I find this mean? How do I know what y bar was or x bar? If I have the interval, how do I find x bar? Yeah, you find the middle. You average them, right? So x bar is going to be whatever those two added together divided by 2 is, which ends up being, I typed in all the numbers. I didn't actually round, 72.692. That's what's in the middle. So how does that help me find the margin of error? What's the margin of error? Like, what is it in general? Not what the number is. What is it? Right, it's what you added or subtracted both sides, right? So you can do 74.5 minus that, or you can do the middle minus 70.887, right? It's whatever you add and subtract to either side. So if you do that, the margin of error is, I think, 1.81. Just find the difference between the middle and one of those sides. Everyone know how I got the number? See the middle. Oh, subtract them and divide by two. And then you add, and then you add that number back. Yes. Yeah. You have to add the middle back. Yes, yeah, you can do that. That's fine. Questions about B? Did you get close to 1.81 CPAP? Okay. If the researcher had calculated a 99% confidence interval, would the margin of error be larger or smaller? So if you had a 95% confidence interval and now you win a 99% confidence interval, what happens? The interval would be get margin of error increase, right? What happens? Does it get wider or narrower? It gets wider, right, from 95, think about the middle 95% to the middle 99%, you've gotten a wider, and so that means your margin of error had to increase because the middle is staying the same, right? Questions about nine. Interval got wider, so the margin of error got larger. All right, next one we're actually going to do an interval. And earlier I looked at the wrong question the entire time I was layering. All right, here we go. The researcher, described in exercise 9, also measured the body temperatures of that randomly selected group of adults. Here are summaries of the data he collected. We wish to estimate the average or normal temperature among the adult population. It gives you the summary statistics in a table. That's nice. It also gives you a picture. That's going to be good for checking the nearly normal condition. Okay? So part A, check the conditions for creating a t-interval. I'm not going to waste the time to write them all down. All right, the first one is, Independent slash random, right? Are each one of these individuals independent of each other? They should be because it's a randomly selected group of adults, right? So that's your random condition. Here's the number of people. It's 52 less than 10% of all people. I should definitely hope so. That's why they're saying the 10% condition is kind of not really necessarily important all the time. 52 is definitely less than 10% of all people, right? 
But so now we have to do sample size, nearly normal. Look at this picture. Is it unimodal and symmetric? Not as much as we would like it to be, right? But is our sample size pretty large? Yeah, it's over 50. So I'm going to say that the sample size is large enough. If you think about it, look at these intervals. Look at these little bars. These are probably like one degree. No, not one degree. 0.1 degree or 0.2, right? So if I had changed the bin width, could I have made it probably more normal? Probably. Or if I did like um, 0.5 degrees instead of 0.2 degrees, I could have put more information into the different bars, right? So since the sample size is large enough, I'm going to say that we've met the nearly normal condition. You especially want to watch out if you have smaller samples, or if your histogram is like definitely skewed or definitely has a crazy outlier, then you'd be more cautious. Here I can see all of my data is all nice and kind of put together the same range of temperatures. I've got a large enough sample size, so it should be okay. All right? So check my conditions. Because the conditions have been met, I can use a T model with what degrees of freedom? 51 degrees of freedom and a one sample T interval, right? You want to identify the degrees of freedom somewhere in the question. They will count off if you don't. This is why. The AP graders, if you make a minor mistake, want to make sure that they can follow the rest of your work so they can give you points to make sure if you knew the rule of concept, you just made a minor mistake. If they don't know the degrees of freedom you use, they don't know what model you use, they can't do that. Okay? On part B, find a 98% confidence interval for the mean body temperature. So we've got Y bar plus or minus T of 51 times S over the square root of N. That's our formula, right? So you have to look at the chart to find information. What is Y bar? Ninety-eight point two eight five. That's the mean. That's what y bar is. The mean. We're going to find that t value in a second. What's s? Standard deviation of the sample. Point six eight two four divided by the square root of fifty two. Then we're going to use our calculator to do the t critical value. Right now it's ninety-eight percent. So what's your area you're using? 0.01, 51 degrees of freedom, so you should get 2.4. Okay. You end up getting this interval. 98.058 to 98.512-ish, depending on how you round. S is the standard deviation of your sample. So we need to explain the meaning of the interval. I'm not going to take the time to write it out, but we should say what? We are 98% confident that the true mean body temperature is between 98.06 and 98.5 degrees. Make sure you have degrees somewhere in symbols or words. Have to have units, right? In part D, explain what 98% confidence means in this context. This goes back to chapter 19. 98% confidence means in 98% of samples of size 52, confidence intervals could be made that contained mu. The true proportion, the true, sorry, the true mean body temperature. Right, that's from chapter 19 stuff too, right? 98% mm -hmm. of samples of size 52 would be able to construct a confidence interval that contained the true mean mu, like the population mean. confidence interval with the true mean. So if we did another sample of this, 
kept doing samples of this. 98% of the time we're going to get confidence intervals that contain mu. Mm -hmm. That's the p-value. And then on part E, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is commonly assumed to be normal. Do these data suggest otherwise? Look at our interval. Is 98.6 in your interval? No. So these data suggest otherwise, right? I'm 98% confident that the true mean is in my interval, right? So since 98.6 is not in it, I think there's evidence that the true body temperature is not 98.6. Nice try. Questions about this? It's generally the same, right? All right, quickly I want to go through some other questions about this question. It's number 15, but it's about the same question. Okay? Consider statistics, yada, yada. A, would a 90% confidence interval be wider or narrower than the 98% confidence interval from the last question? Narrower, right? You go from 98% and then you go to the middle 90%. So it's going to be narrower. What? Okay, well, okay. You can say more narrow. That's fine. What are the advantages and disadvantages of a 98% confidence interval compared to like a 90%? So what's an advantage of having a 98% confidence interval instead of a 90% confidence interval? It's the obvious, this is the obvious thing, it's not a trick question. No, we're not. You're more confident. You're 98% confident. What's a disadvantage? You have a larger interval. Right? We're going to get to that. But yeah, so we have an advantage that we're 98% confident, but we have a disadvantage that we have a wide interval. In C. If we conduct research, this time you have a sample of 500 adults, it's a 98% confidence interval to change. Do you increase your sample size? Your interval is actually going to get narrower. But you've increased the sample. Right? And you said that as the sample size increases, that the T decreases, right? You said that earlier. Last one, okay, I'm going I'm to finish. I just want to set this up for you. How large a sample might you allow you to estimate the mean body temperature to do within 0.1 degrees with 98% confidence? This goes back to setting up the margin of error equation and solving for n. But I want to say this. If you did that, you'd have 0.1 equals, and you'd have a t critical value of n minus 1 times S over the square root of n, right? We could go back and get S from the last question, from number 13. But if you don't know n, can you find t? No, because you have to have the degrees of freedom, right? So to ask this type of question, what you need to do is you need to estimate with z star instead. You have another option. You can't find t, so you estimate with z. Yeah, you do inverse norm instead. Okay? All right. Did I delete your assignment? Man, I'm...